Good morning, everyone. And um, we're now we've moved into Judges chapter nine. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your help as we again look at Judges chapter nine, as we did several months ago. We ask, Lord, that we can understand the placement of this within the lines and that any misunderstandings we may have of this uh, section of scripture that you can correct. We ask, Lord, that um, the work that, that we do here in study will help us in our day-to-day -day lives, in our struggles, and that the things we learn are that we can impart to others. We ask that our characters can be transformed and that we can reflect your character in all that we do. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and lead us as we open your word together. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we had placed um, chapter 6, 7, and 8 on a line. And we, we're working with the premise that um, the book of Judges covers the history of this movement from 19 or from 9 11 in 2001 until um, 2023. So we know that six, seven, and eight brought us up to 2023. And so when we're looking at Judges chapter nine, what we have to decide is, is what time this is speaking of. And I think that it, it goes back uh, to after um, July 18, 2020, up to 2023. That's my understanding of this. But there's still lots of things we have to sort out in, 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 in really grasping what it's saying to us. I mean, it's easy to say that we can pl place this in a line somewhere with this general sort of outline, but there are some very specific things that it's talking about. And um, when we look at the spirit of prophecy, she doesn't say a great deal about Abimelech. It's basically a few paragraphs and um, a few other stray statements that I could find. Uh, what we know about Abimelech is he's envious, he's proud, he's not doing according to God's will. Uh, in that sense, and the the, the subheading that uh, the Bible gives here, that my Bible gives here online, is is uh, or the E sword is Abimelech's conspiracy, and um, it, it doesn't really use the conspiracy anywhere in the, the scripture here, but that's the word that they've chose to describe this story. Now, we started looking at this a little bit yesterday. So we know that there's uh, Abimelech is the son of a concubine that was born to Gideon, and Gideon has 70 other sons. Uh, the oldest we know, his name is Yether, and the youngest is Yotham. Um, so these two are the only two sons of Gideon that are mentioned Besides Abimelech, right? So we have the three that are mentioned, but the two of the 70. Now, I was, I was looking online, and, you know, we know the 70 sons are going to be killed. And, and some people said, well, this is a contradiction, because if there was 70 sons and 70 of them are killed, but there's still Jotham left over, how is it that there is 70 sons? And I always find these kinds of objections very odd. Um, so I know I'm addressing this other point here, but what is the problem with somebody saying that there is a contradiction? That there are 70 sons and 70 are killed, but there's obviously one that's left over. So, but they always talk about the 70 sons that were killed. What's the problem with that? that idea that there's a contradiction. Uh, 
It's a t- it's an error in reasoning. Yeah, it's an error in reasoning, and lots of reasoning problems here. I mean, the first one is if it's a contradiction, it's it's definitely on the surface, and whoever wrote it would have been contradicting themselves. It's not like we have some passage over in one place in the Bible, another passage in another, and there's a fair contradiction. It would be that the person writing it just contradicted themselves, um, which is, and that nobody really noticed it until some critics came along in the 20th century and started pointing this out. Um, so uh, the big problem is that we just don't understand how stories are told in the Bible, that often the contradictions that people see are just not contradictions at all. It's just how people would communicate an idea. Right. So we know there isn't, you know, some people have a solution that there is actually this younger son is not included in the number of the 70. Right. So, so it's, it's kind of interesting how people reason things through. But also they will see it then as a contradiction and somehow that the Bible isn't true because it has this contradiction. But anyway, that's just kind of an aside. I don't know if it's really pertinent to what we're doing right now, but I find this type of reasoning occurring again and again. And, and it should be pretty obvious to the person that it's not reasonable reasoning. Um, so anyway, we know that... Uh, Gideon is going to go to his maternal grandfather and and he wants that him to speak to the men of Shechem and uh, particularly um, it's going to be his uncles so the grandfather is going to speak to his sons um, regarding the idea that Abimelech should reign over them instead of the 70 sons of, uh, okay. Judges 9 is similar to 2 Kings 11. You're talking about um, what story there, Angela? I'm talking about when Joash was spared, he was hidden from, from the queen who was slaughtering all the seed royal. Okay. How how is the story similar? Well, because there was one son that was spared, right? Okay. And there was there was a yeah, she conspired to kill, kill yeah. all the seed royal. Yeah, okay. Um I, I know what you're saying, but I, I don't think there's enough of a similarity to sort of connect this in any way in lines or things like that. I mean, jealousy and envy exists and is manifest in many stories of the Bible, people who are seeking power. But um, th there is a point, though, about the youngest. So remember, we have either who's the eldest and we have Yotham, who's the youngest. And what would that remind us of? You are thinking about um, Jer Jericho? Yeah, the rebuilding of Jericho. And I would think that that's a symbol that we could at least attach to um, the seven times, right? Does that make sense? Well, that's possible. But there's there's actually some things out of spirit of prophecy that we could look at that would give support to what you were addressing yesterday regarding the placement of this part of the story within our current timeline okay so what's that 
what's the okay about the time of the demise of James White yeah. Mrs. White penned an article that appeared in the Science of the Times August 4th 1881 And it really it really sets the tone for what we're looking at with Judges 9. Okay. Um, so August 4th, 1881. Uh, do you know which paragraph that we would read? Well, if we start, basically, if, if we start at the beginning and we went through the first four, four to six paragraphs, they're a quick read. Okay. I mean... The course of Israel after the death of Gideon is thus described by the sacred historian. The children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. When men cast away the fear of God, they need not be surprised to see them departing from the path of honor and integrity. They are following another guide. They hurry on in the journey of life, heedless, presumptuous, yet ever fearful and dissatisfied, for they have left the only one who can give them rest and security. When once started in a wrong path, many press on as if infatuated, although every step leads them further and from the source of light and the tower of strength. So here again, we have a reference back to a tower like Penuel, but we're also being given a reference to light. The great sin of Israel had ever been that of departing from God, forgetting his matchless love and his mighty power as revealed again and again in their deliverance. An appreciation of the Lord's mercy and goodness will lead to an appreciation of those who, like Gideon, have been employed as instruments to bless the people. The cruel course of Israel toward the house of Gideon was that which might be expected from a people who manifested such base ingratitude to God. Now, have we not seen this occurring within the world since just before July 18th of 2020. Have we not seen this base ingratitude to God within the movement since July 19th, 2020, with what all has been going on? Yeah. yeah, that's why I put the death of Gideon there. Is, uh, you know, this is after the death of Gideon that these things arise. And this would lead to what's happened in the movement, um, but a little bit different than what we see in um, in the other lines. So I wasn't really sure where to mark this exactly in the lines. We can see it definitely fits. The calamities which had constantly threatened them being in the past, the selfishness of Israel now became apparent. July 18th is in the past. The selfishness mm -hmm. of the movement is now apparent. The men so grateful after that glorious victory over Midian now forgot their offer to place Gideon and his sons upon the throne. They had been filled with wonder and admiration by the noble, unselfish, unambitious spirit which prompted him to refuse the honor both for himself and for his sons. But the impression wore away as other influences were brought to bear upon them. Gratitude died out in their hearts, and after Gideon's death, the people treated his sons with the basest neglect and cruelty. The human heart is fickle. It is not to be trusted. All who rely upon the favor or the support of men will sooner or later find themselves leaning upon a broken reed. So all of these situations that we've been addressing, yeah. we're looking at many that are looking for the support of men. When mm -hmm. we're looking at these various predictions that have been being made, 
-hmm. Are not other men supporting men rather than looking to God for their wisdom? Hmm. Well, yes. So, you know, in, in thinking this through, because I've, I've, you know, I've always spent a lot of time thinking about what has happened and, and why, why people take the actions that they do. I mean, I, I try to understand not just others, but also myself. Why, why do I do certain things? Why do I react to something in some way? Now, you know, we had this, this prediction, July 18th, and we could see that there wasn't, there, there wasn't really a wholehearted support for it in many people in the movement that, in, in a sense, it, they were reluctant in having to warn Nashville and reluctant in taking this position because how, of how they thought they would appear um, if it didn't occur, right? So that, okay. was, that seemed pretty evident to me. Um, you know, and I, I fought against it personally uh, when I was there in Arkansas in 2018, when we first made the July 18, 2020 prediction. And then even after it was revived by Jeff, um, there does, there wasn't really um, an acceptance. Well, there wasn't an interest in really understanding the prediction, I guess is the way that I would look at it. The arguments that we had brought to to come to this conclusion, um, people were in interested in certain aspects of it, but other aspects they weren't. And they definitely weren't interested in looking that, that the prophecy might fail, that the prediction would not happen as we expected. Um, you know, maybe in, a lot of that's in God's providence. But when we had the failure, we definitely saw quite clearly um, what might have been sort of hinted at that we might have seen just maybe maybe it was our imagination of how people were acting. But now we could see quite clearly where people stood. And, and I'm still kind of puzzled what, why people aren't much more open um, and willing to sort of examine things. And, and I think that's the case still. Like, don't we want to know what the truth is for the very simple reason that if we're making a decision, it should be based upon reality, not upon some wishful thinking? Or presumptions or anything else? You know, if, if, we, if we want to believe something, we should take everything that we have to examine it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, pick evidences that support our view and ignore things that don't support our view. But the reason why people don't has to do with their emotions, right? You know, base emotions, really. Right. I mean, envy. Envy is, I mean, it's so deceptive. In, in this situation, as, as we are looking at this right now, are we not looking at a message that goes from cause to effect? Well, everything goes from cause to effect. Well, but are we not being given ex given an example, mm -hmm. a very clear example of what happens from yeah. cause to effect? Yeah. So, so we're, we're being given a clear warning in, in all the words of Scripture, and in this story, we we can see quite clearly. We should be able to quite see quite clearly our situation. We should be able to see ourselves in this. So, with this. As it, as it goes through in paragraph five, yet Gideon himself had sowed the seeds for that baleful harvest. 
when he performed that one wrong act by which Israel was led away from God. Now they had become blinded by the sophistry of Satan, and they were wandering away from him who was their light, their strength, and their glory. The Lord withdrew his restraining spirit from them and gave them up to their own base passions. Okay, so, so she's referring to the making of the ephod. I would agree. But in this, in this situation... What is she also referring to when she states that the Lord withdrew his restraining spirit from them? Is uh, his spirit not being withdrawn now? Yeah. So the situation is that a mistake had been made by Gideon by mm -hmm. the construction of the ephod. Mm -hmm. A mistake had been made within the movement where something, a remnant of Parminder and Tess was still being accepted. Mm -hmm. Now, so part of the thing is with the construction of the ephod, I mean, well, let's, let's take a look at one little aspect of the lines that Parminder had laid out. These, these lines were addressing the priests, Levites, and Nethanims, right? The Nethanim. And, I mean, this was an idea that first came from Jeff. Okay. So this came from, I'm not sure exactly where the idea first came from. I believe it was from Ezra chapter 7. I think that's correct. Yeah. So that, that would have been something that would have come in. 2015. Well, what I was going to say with Emiliano. Um, no, because I don't think they looked at that part in 2014, maybe at the end of 2014. But I don't think Emiliano had this idea. Uh, it definitely came from Jeff. I mean, at least he's the first one that presented it even if somebody else might have pointed it out to him. I don't know. But, you know, we had the priest, Levite, Nathanims, the porters, and the singers. For some reason, we just stuck to the three groups. And now Parminder then built this structure. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Y'all talking about Ezra's 9, 7, I mean, 7, 9. Yes. Um, well, well, Jeff, not Jeff. so much. What's that? Huh? No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, Ezra, yeah, so it's not really just Ezra 7 9, because that that's that's going to be Emiliano. It's um the priest Levites and Nethanim. So that's gonna be, I'm just trying to find out where this is. Maybe it's chapter eight. Maybe it's chapter eight that they mention them. Um no, it's chapter seven, verse seven. And there went up some of the children of Israel, of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the porters, the Nethanim, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And so for some reason, they focused upon the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanim. The singers and the porters aren't mentioned, right, in the sense of how we constructed these lines. So I'm not really sure exactly why he chose these three and not five. But, but that's, that's how it was understood. Um, and I believe it was that verse. I don't believe they used chapter 8 in this case, at least not initially. And, and then you're going to see in chapter 8, um, they're going to have, um, when Ezra sends for the Levites, right? And it talks about the Nethanim. Um, so, see, and it talks about also of the Nethanim, which or whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim. And so maybe it was, maybe it was from chapter 8, verse 20, where you have these 220 Nethanim 
that maybe Jeff kind of put this together because this is a symbol of restoration. And he did connect, um, you know, that, that symbol. So, but, but anyway, the point that I'm bringing up here has to do with this construction of the ephod and that this construction of the ephod um, is something that, you know, it's not directly related to the July 18, 2020 message, but it's definitely utilized by the July 18, 2020 message in how we understood the lines. Um, and so, you know, we could say it's something that's at least constructed to some degree by July 18, 2020, even though it, it goes back to Parminder um, and Jeff. But I think it's it's the big problem because right now we're, we're doing a series on um, understanding the lines. And it's it's quite clear to me that we had a misunderstanding of the lines and a misuse of the lines, especially by Parminder and Tabo, in trying to place um, what the purpose of the movement was. That is, they wanted to make this movement priests. Now, what did they mean by that? Because we have priests, Levites, and Nethanims. But what was Parminder doing? He was saying that only the priests were the 144,000, correct? Right. And, and that's not true. So he was trying to make this idea, this illustration of priest Levites and Nethanim that we see in Ezra. He was trying to make this in, into special classes that exist within Adventism, within the final uh, movements at the end of the world. But when we understand priests, we don't understand that we're priests, right? In any sort of literal sense, it's a symbol. Correct? Do people agree with me or do they, you think that we are actually priests as of our involvement in, in a certain part of the line? Okay, is it wrong to think that there has to be a priest in order to be able to give instruction to the Levites? Yeah, so that's a symbol, right? All right. But does it make us a special class or group of people that somehow it is honored above all other people or something like that? You understand what I'm saying? I, I understood the priest Levites and Nethanim, even when we, we had those lines in the way that we did, that these were symbolic, not literal. I don't I don't see how we could take this in a literal aspect at this point regardless yeah but people people took it that way right um for parminder and tabo who believed that we were creating this new church um you know the elders became even this special class now where you know people are going to confess their sins to them um that there was this hierarchy that was being developed which is catholic right It is very based upon the the pagan Catholic understanding. Yeah. So so what they did is they created a cult. You know, in in the sort of uh, the modern sense of the word, not the old fashioned sense of the word. You know, they they created a a cult, a group, a religious group that was really controlling its members, and they used these symbols. Priests, Levites, Nethanim, is sort of distinguishing these different classes of people. And, you know, when people would wonder, well, you know, is this person a priest or are they a Levite? You know, how do we decide that? Some people would say, well, I'm not a priest because I came in the movement too long. And, and it's like, what are you talking about? You know, this is just a symbol on a line. It's not talking about any individuals in that sense. It's just giving this progression of events because that's what a line is about. And it has to do with the progression of how light unfolds. Now, the problem with the priest Levites and Nethanim lines, 
was that we were setting up them up in this sort of staggered sense. And, and that never sat well with me because we don't see it in Millerite history. We do see, um, you know, Samuel Snow's line, right? So we see that, but Samuel Snow's line is a zoom into, as we understand it now, a zoom into a particular way mark. Which would be agreed. Yeah. So so now we understand that but what we do to create a line is not somehow just artificially put some lines up and say this is one group and this is the next group and this is the next group. I, I don't think priests, Levites, and Nethanim should be considered separate lines. They are representing, the priests represent those who first receive the message, right, who are Adventists who are part of the 144,000 or could be part of the 144,000, right? Because some of us may be alive at the end of the world. But Parminder said that the 144,000 were just the priests. The Levites weren't included in that. And then the Levites are just Seventh-day Adventists who receive this message later. And then we tried to make the Nethanim the 11th hour workers. Now, the problem I had with that is that in each line, you have 11th hour workers, right? 11th hour workers would not refer to those that come uh, to the Nethanim as some group that comes at the end. The 11th hour workers is just the people who come in later within a line. Those are just the people that join before that line ends. And... Now, somebody could say, well, you're going to have Adventists come first, and then you're going to have Protestants join prior to the Sunday law. But that would put Nethanim, if you're going to use it in that sense, and that's the way I use it, you're going to put it before the Sunday law, not as this separate line that ends with the close of probation after the Sunday law and the loud cry. So, I mean, Nethanim can become a symbol but I don't think that we should put it in the lines the way that we do these three lines, priest, Levites, and Nethanim. And, you know, and I've had that position for a long time, even before July 18th. And which is why I couldn't understand the lines as they were being constructed because they were inconsistent and, and, and sort of arbitrary and subjective. And then Parminder created these very confusing lines in 2018 that were presented by Daniel from Brazil at the School of the Prophets in September of 2018. And um, there was just so much wrong with what he was saying. And one is each of these lines were different and had to do with the agricultural model and all these different things that he was throwing up there that just contradicted each other. There was no sort of consistency. And so anyway, the point is the ephod being constructed is, is for a person to assume the role of a priest, right? Correct. And, and so I'm saying that, that the people who are assuming this role of a priest, because they're priests on a line, on a symbolic line, that's the stumbling block. It, it allows for... Um, you know, self-exaltation and usurpation. It, it results in things like December 6, 2020. You know, all ye are brethren. There is no leadership. There's no hierarchy in this movement. Christ is our king. You know, he's our high priest. We, we are ministers, you know, we've been given a role to minister to others. We have not been given a role of authority just because we happen to receive some light. So, so I'm saying that the, the ephod could represent that idea 
of the role of the priest, this movement assuming this role. It's not really ours to, to assume. Because that's what we see in, in Abimelech, is this spirit, spirit of envy and pride, of self-exaltation and usurpation. And, and what he's doing is, and, and, and I'm connecting that, I'm connecting that to the story of the ephod. That is, I'm connecting these stories together as illustrating the same thing. Because they both happen after the death of Gideon, that they become, this becomes a stumbling block. Does that seem reasonable? It's got some points. Okay. So, so we have the we have the ephod, but we have Abimelech, and to me, they're illustrating the same story that because they have the same characteristics. But I think the the issue that we have to look at too is that there's a little bit more behind this. Oh, oh yeah, there's more behind this here because there's a lot more detail. Well. And it goes a little farther. So well, it, it goes quite a far, quite a bit farther. Yeah. I mean, the spirit of prophecy is supporting part of what you were saying yesterday. Mm -hmm. Because according to the evil custom of those days, Gideon had taken numerous wives, and at his death he left no less than 70 sons. Beside these, there was another Abimelech, the mm -hmm. son of a strange woman. This person had no right in the inheritance with Gideon's lawful children, and his debased character rendered him more unworthy to be numbered with the descendants of the illustrious leader. The sons of Gideon had concurred in their father's refusal to accept the throne of Israel, but Abimelech determined to secure the position for himself. Being a native of Shechem, where his mother's relatives dwelt, he induced them to influence the Shechemites in his favor. He endeavored to advance his own interests by basely misrepresenting his brethren. He accused them of designing to seize upon the government and unite in its administration. And he sought to convince the people that it would be much better for them to be ruled by one of their own number than by such a band of tyrants. So what Abimelech was doing is he was revealing his own character and blaming, on, blaming it on someone else. Mm -hmm. Are we not seeing that right now within this movement? Yeah. So had the Israelites preserved a clear perception of right and wrong, they would have seen the fallacy of, of Abimelech's reasoning and the injustice of his claims. They would have seen that he was filled with envy and actuated by a base ambition to exalt himself by the ruin of his brethren. Those who are controlled by policy rather than principle are not to be trusted. Yeah. Okay. Now, just bring up this point. Um, when we were at the school of the prophets, okay, there was. So, what was happening there was not the model that Ellen White gave for a school. When we were there in 2016, it was the model. It was the model I was familiar with. I've been in the self-supporting work in these types of schools that were um, actually connected with. Um, uh, uh, oh, what's the name of the one that started that Ellen White sat on the board I just can't think of the name off it um, and for Z had been a part of uh, yeah so Madison right so going back and, and it changed its name later on I can't remember the name later but this was all connected we were part of that whole system the school that I was a part of, Silver Hills. 
and you know we had these boards and that you know operated to uh, support these schools and we were using the model that was given in the spirit of prophecy so i was familiar with how we are to have a work program the work program i went to at silver hills we actually the only class we had was the morning worship we already read um through the conflict of the ages series at the guest house where we'd have the the patients there and we would have about sometimes 20 people we would just go through and read and discuss uh conflict of the ages that was the only class we had we worked eight hours a day sometimes longer in harvest season but that was a work program it was productive that is we were supporting the school by the work that we were doing when we were cutting firewood, when we were cutting lumber, when we were growing in market gardens, everything was profitable. It was productive. It wasn't just token work to make it look like it's work. Mostly what we did in 2018 was simply cleaning things that didn't need to be cleaned and, and doing unproductive gardening. It, it was, from my perspective, of somebody who likes to accomplish things it was it was not in accordance with god's plan but it was being presented that anybody who sort of suggested anything should be done differently that we somehow were rejecting the the plan that helen white had for or education we were rebellious or we were rebellious um and and things weren't were not running well so lots everybody was unhappy um so what what was happening was um, that we had this pretense of doing something that's according to God's will. But really, it was just about control and power. And, and we saw this really being manifested later at December 6, 2020. But anyway, the main reason I brought this up had to do with this policy and principle. So what they were trying to do was solve problems with policy rather than understanding the principles involved. And, and at one point, they actually changed the word. They, they, they said, we're not going to use the word policy. We're going to use the word principle. So they decided to call policy principle. Mm -hmm. They it, didn't it, change their behavior. It, it was quite bizarre. Um, that they could just change the meaning of the word uh, halfway through a meeting um, and not understand the difference between policy and principle. So this is what people try to do. They try to use policy rules, man-made rules, instead of understanding the principles behind them and how we, we are to act. And anytime I brought up a principle, that comes from the Bible or the spirit of prophecy, especially in regard to self-supporting work to, to these uh, schools, the school of the prophets and how it should operate. It was not welcome. They did not want to hear anything about policy to them. That was just sh sheerly rebellion. They didn't want to hear anything about policy. Uh, or, principle. or principle. I mean, principle, right? So th they just, they just had policies and these policies were destructive. I mean, they were just, creating all kinds of problems and completely arbitrary. Yeah. So anyway, so this is what I think about when I, when I think about what we saw manifested after July 18th, it was this spirit that had been um, basically nurtured for a long time within the movement that Jeff was unaware of. Jeff didn't know what was going on. So, you know, if he had, things would have changed, but he, he wasn't involved, right? And he just accepted the reports that he got from those that he had trusted. And, and so this was a mistake. And this is what we saw manifest on December 6, 2020, and even before, and how they approached addressing, how do we understand July 18th? So if we're going to go back to the statement, according to evil, the evil custom of those days, Gideon had taken numerous wives, and at his death he left no less than 70 sons. 
Um, and also having this Abimelech, the son of a strange woman, it says here. So that would be a foreign woman. We had, we had said that it was just a concubine, but Ellen White here has the son of a strange woman, which would be a foreigner. Right. This person had no right in the inheritance of Gideon's lawful children, and his debased character rendered him still more unworthy to be numbered with the descendants of the illustrious leader. The sons of Gideon had concurred in their father's refusal to accept the throne of Israel, but Abimelech determined to secure the position for himself. So we see the spirit of envy. And um, so we, we don't have a clear perception of right and wrong, that is truth and error. Or we would see, we would see where we're heading as a movement. So when people do are controlled by policy rather than principle, uh, she says, um, we pervert the truth, conceal facts, and construe the words of others to mean that which was never intended. We employ flattering words while the poison of asps is under our tongue. And, and we are not really seeking divine guidance, right? And, and if we're not seeking divine guidance, we can be deceived by these things. So this has happened in the movement. And, and some of the words, some of this stuff that happened in 2018, there are people in the movement acting based upon these reports uh, against me personally of what happened in 2018, even though they've seen the character of those who gave them these reports. So the, so the people that tend to be the most um, opposed to what's, what's happening in our studies are people who were there in 2019 at the camp meeting and and received reports about me personally and Heidi and have carried those reports and and it has colored everything that has happened regarding July 18th and afterwards and this is this is the spirit of Abimelech So this, this spirit rules the, the movement uh, for how long, we'll find when we study this. When it comes to the head. Ahead. So anyway, anything else in this that you want to look at, Dwight? Well, <clears throat> With this statement that those who are controlled by policy rather than principle are not to be trusted. Mm -hmm. They will pervert the truth, conceal facts, and construe the words of others to mean that which was never intended. Mm -hmm. Now, you covered well this portion about the flattering words and the poison of asps. Mm -hmm. There are many who would scorn the appellation of policy men, yet who would stoop to concealment, evasion, and even misrepresentation to accomplish their purposes. He who in a manner of right and wrong remains non-committal, that he may retain the friendship of all. He who seeks to secure by evasion of truth what should be won by courage, he who waits for others to take the lead when he should go forward himself and then feels at liberty to censure their course. All these are in God's sight numbered as deceivers. Yeah, so the one principle is that we should all, everything should be as open as the day. There should not ever be secret committees making decisions, you know, maneuverings, um, politics, because really 
politics is just policy, right? Right. That's, they're just the same word, just uh, we've come to sort of separate them. The people who are involved in political maneuver, that's what she's talking about. And that has happened in this movement. Well, it's it's more than that. And it's deceptive, right? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's more than that. It's it's deception. Deception is being employed. And 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 we can't be non-committal. What we cannot afford. We can't we just can like keep our friends and not offend our friends because that's a type of deception. That, that's what Parminder did. He was deceit, deceitful by not telling us his true position. Isn't it also deceitful to be saying time will tell? Well, yes. And, and I know that, you know, it, it, it's a difficult thing because, you know, I know Colin, he's a good friend and I have no ill will towards him, but he, he's made some mistakes in that he hasn't, he's allowed people to come in who he knows that they have problems, but he doesn't want to offend them. So he didn't want to be associated with me. Like, cause I asked him, can you come and present your studies on our Friday night studies? And he says, I can't, people will be upset. It's, you know, like, well, first I said, you know, maybe we should have a study. I'll be there at the study. I can present, you know, what I understand about this and, and, you know, we can, we can sort of have a study on, on your terms. Right. And he said, no, people, people would be upset. They wouldn't come and listen if you're there. And he, he, he said they would be unhappy if he came to, to my study and presented. And, and to me, that doesn't make any sense. But he should have been willing. And also he apologized to me when we had a misunderstanding, but he wouldn't apologize publicly. He wouldn't admit that what he had said in a meeting was not, not, was not true. And, and he apologized to me personally, but he wouldn't apologize to the group that he had said all these things about me that he knew were true. He wasn't gonna take back his words because people would be upset. So I'm not trying to say anything about, about Colin. I'm not trying to attack him. I'm just saying that he has, he has made this mistake. And I believe that he will recognize this mistake. Okay. And, and, you know, I've dealt with situations with friends as well. Mm -hmm. But this statement is very direct. Mm -hmm. But we also yeah. can't know people's motives. We can't understand all the things involved in why people act the way they do. And so it's not our role to just, to see what somebody's doing, we can recognize it's wrong, but we can't judge the heart. We can't really judge the motives of, a, of an individual. But we can tell you, I mean, I can tell you quite plainly that he made a mistake in not apologizing, not trying to, um, you know, offend anyone when we actually needed to be much more open about these differences over um, the presidents of the United States. And we should have studied that together instead of me having to present his presentations, you know, what he had presented and then study it on my own, you know, study it with my group we shouldn't have all these these differences we should all be able to study together and we shouldn't have these personal feelings that people have dictate how we relate to to others that that really have nothing to do with knowing the truth i mean i'm trying to be as clear as i can on on this this point that we are in trouble for this very spirit of Abimelech exists within us. And, and it's not enough to just see that it exists in one person. I mean, we can see the example of it. Because we have to be careful that it doesn't exist in us. You know, are we non-committal? Are we seeking to retain friendship by being non-committal? thinking that we're being wise, you know, we don't want to, 
we don't want to be kicked out of the group. We want to still be able to communicate with people. And if we, we make a stand, then somehow we're going to be grouped with this person that they're attacking. Right. I mean, the, this to me is what I would call cowardice. Not being able to stand up for the truth. When you know it's the truth, but you you can't stand up. If you can't stand up for the truth now, you're not going to be able to stand up for the truth at the Sunday law. Because your friends are not all going to be on the side of truth. And not worrying about who you're going to offend. Jesus didn't really care who he offended. You know, I... This spirit of Abimelech, you know, it says, while he thus exalted the highest position in the gift of the nation, he was utterly unworthy of the trust. And, and this is so common in human nature. The ones who should not be in charge of things, the ones who are ennoble and vicious, they're the ones who end up in charge of things. You know that um, time will tell. Mm -hmm. Isn't that prophecy? No, that's not prophecy at all. You time have to wait. The Lord says you have to wait. And it will not tarry. Well, that's not time will tell. Time will tell is, I don't know whether I'm correct or not. Whether I'm correct, correct or not, time will tell. And if it, and if it, if it hap if it doesn't happen the way I expect, well, then I was wrong. That's not Bible. We have a more sure word of prophecy, right? So prophecy is certain. It's never time will tell. And, and this is more sitting on the fence because people say, well, you know, somebody makes this prediction. So I'm going to wait to see how it turns out. Then I'll decide what to believe. But we need to know what to believe before then. And, and what ends up happening with time will tell is if the prophecy doesn't happen and it didn't happen and it won't happen, uh, the people who were trusting that it was going to happen, where is their faith then anchored? Their faith was misplaced. Yeah. Greatly. Mm -hmm. Now, in this in this big picture, we have a Bimelech who is appealing to the people of Shechem, right? Mm -hmm. We agree. He is appealing to those of his mother's family. Right? Yeah. He is appealing to those of his church, technically, as a message, right? Yeah. Yet, Shechem is also a symbol. Yeah, because it's between Gerizim and Ebal. First mention. Okay, well, the first mention. Doesn't, doesn't Shechem take us back? to coming out of Babylon and the removal of the idols from Jacob's family. So Sikkim, as it's originally called, the other spelling, right? Well, I'm looking, I'm, again, I'm referring back to Spirit of Prophecy. Okay. But, yeah, but originally, I'm just saying, if you want to look it up, you have to look it up. It's spelled differently. Right. 
Well, it is spelled differently in the Bible, but according to the spirit of prophecy, this is where it occurred. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It's the same place. It's just got a different name. How do you spell it? What's the other spelling? I I wouldn't be able to tell you what the other spelling is right now. I'm just looking at S-H-E-C-H-E-M. In the spirit of prophecy. Yes. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying in the Bible, it uses a different spelling, doesn't it? In, in different places. I'm just trying to remember. Okay. In the Bible, we have Shechem as Hebrew 7, 9, 2, 7. We have 49 references. That's the place between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So the place is first mentioned is Genesis 12, 6. So that's a symbol of 1260 or 2520. Right. So yeah, so that's going to be uh, Genesis 12, 6. And we have the situation here where that's Abraham comes out and and he goes to Sikkim. Yes, yeah, S-I-C-H-E-M. That's the same word. But it's just spelled as Sikkim in Genesis 12, 6. So that's the first mention. So we come from there to Genesis 33, 18. Where Jacob came unto Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddamaram and pitched his tent before the city. And Paddam Iran is just um, uh, Aram being a uh, reference to um, Syria. So it's, it's um, uh, part of Syria. So Paddam Iran means that the field of Syria. It's a, a planar tableland in northern Mesopotamia, most Mesopotamia and Aram, a region of Syria. So that's where he he just come out of uh, when when uh, Abraham came out of, of Babylon, he's going to go to Syria first. Okay. So so he's going to come out of Pandan. He came from Pandamaran and pitched his tent. So here you're going to have. Um, uh, Jacob, he's going to come out of Pandamaran and pitch his scent in Shechem. So now he's in the land of Canaan. Right? Right. In 318. Now that's followed, of course, by Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. Yeah. Followed from there with what I was getting at, Genesis 35, 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. Right. So there's going to be that oak. And it's mentioned another place too, uh, the oak by Shechem. Now, the following story that comes up is again one of jealousy mm -hmm. because Israel sends Joseph to check on his brothers who were supposed to be tending the flocks by Shechem. Yeah. <clears throat> so Jacob requests all the strange idols, all of the earrings, all of the things that are making his family look as if they belong to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. He seeks to be done with those, and he hides them under the oak at Shechem. 
he sends Joseph to check on the brothers that are supposed to be tending the flocks by Shechem. And the brothers are showing great jealousy because they don't like what's been occurring with Joseph. They don't like the favor that he's being shown. They don't like anything else. So they choose not to accept, as they're seeing it, the dreamer. Yeah. Okay. So where exactly are you going with this, though? I don't, I don't understand how this is. I mean, we have Shechem. Right. So that's going to be in this story in Judges. That's that's the place. Are not idols a symbol of the spirit of jealousy? Mm -hmm. Was not jealousy being expressed by the children of Jacob against Joseph. Okay. Yes. It's just, I think the primary reference here though, that we need to take as a symbol has to do with the Mount of blessing and the Mount of curses. Right. I'm not. Okay. I'm not battling you on this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no battling here. I'm just saying that um, because we're going to have Gerizim mentioned dealing with with jotham right fine up on top of gerizim so the symbol here has to do with the 2520 that's why i believe shechem is mentioned here i mean uh, obviously those other things are true about shechem don't all of these situations have to do with the 2520 mm-hmm my the, the problem and the point is that I'm looking at the effect of Abimelech. Yeah. We have the causation being idols. We have this causation of the image of jealousy. Mm -hmm. Abimelech is acting out the image of jealousy because he's jealous of his properly born brothers. Mm -hmm. So he wants to eliminate them. Yet one escapes. One is able to reveal exactly the character of Abimelech. So if Gideon is a message, then Abimelech is a message, and we need to be a, able to pay attention so that we are not accepting the message of Abimelech. Right. And, and, and Jotham is a message as well. Agreed. And, and that message is the, the 70th week. So... See, when I look at, at the problem, okay, here's how I look at it. We, we have human nature. We're, we're all sinners, right? Right. And God has given us a, the everlasting gospel to redeem us, right? Okay. In darkness, he's, he's going to give us light at the moment of our deepest darkness. We're going to... We're going to start receiving light. We're going to respond to light. You know, for the first time, whenever that is, you know, we all have that moment where we're in darkness and we receive light. But that light is progressive. There's an increase of light as we follow that light. And we can we can put those events then in our lives. You know, for me personally, the period of darkness is prior to um, August 11th, 1980. Right. That's when that's when the light came to me and then I saw the light and responded to it. Been trying to be a Christian for a few years before that. But at that point, the light actually shines into the darkness and I see my sin. So, you know, I could start a reform line in my own life dealing with this increase of light. 
We can do that on any reform line. So we know there's a particular darkness, there's a particular light, there's a time of the end. You know, in prophecy in the Bible, it's going to be some prophetic date. But even in our own lives, it's going to be an important date when that light comes to us, when that time of the end comes and the first angel's message arrives. So here we have in as as the remedy is to understand these lines as they relate to this movement. Because the remedy that that this movement needs is an understanding of light. If you try to correct people by pointing out their errors without the gospel doing it, that person is just going to hide further and further into the darkness. You, it's not redemptive. What is redemptive is these lines, right? What God is bringing this movement through is meant to correct us. It's meant to bring about our true conversion. So even though Colin and Odilio put these lines and had a wrong application as far as what those lines meant, those lines are still part of these prophetic lines, right? It's part of a reform line. Okay. And, and it's meant for the redemption of the people in this movement so that we can at the end, and, and the date we have given us dealing with the 70th week is April 5th, 2030. So it's something in the future. But it is a goal that this movement can work towards, because if this movement is going to accomplish its task, it's not going to accomplish it in a week or in a month or in two months. Because that work is not just the work of giving the gospel to to Adventists. It's a work that has to happen in us first. So it's, you know, we can see the problem. The problem is is evident it should be evident to each one of us just looking at our own hearts we should see that we're unprepared to do this work that we haven't done this work and that now god is showing us how he's going to lead us back onto that path to accomplish the things that we need to accomplish and this spirit of abimelech has to be dealt with not just in other people, but in ourselves. And, and the thing that, that brings about this correction is this message of Jotham. Right? And he's going to be upon the top of Mount Gerizim. So he doesn't go up on the Mount of Curses, Mount Ebal. He goes up upon the Mount of Blessing. So, so we know Abimelech is going to slew these 70. He's going to get these base men, right, light persons. They're going to get money out of the temple or the house of Baal Bareth, uh, Lord of the Covenant. And they're going to have these 70 pieces of, of silver being paid to these people who are then going to kill uh, the 70 brethren the sons of Gideon, except one. And that's Jotham, right? The youngest son of Jerubbaal. And, and the fact that we had the oldest son mentioned before, either, and now we have the youngest, to me ties us to the, the rebuilding of Jericho as, as symbols, right? The eldest and the youngest. In this case, uh, they're not going to be killed. But this, this would have to be a restoration of this message, of understanding the significance of it. Now, he's going to come. So all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of, of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar. That was in Shechem, right? So we know that there's this pillar there. It's called the plain of the pillar. This is in Shechem. This is between Mount Gerizim and Ebal. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And he's going to give this parable right about the olive tree and these other trees. So you got this. Um, um, the trees 
and they want to have a king over them, right? And so they're going to finally find the basest of them. It's going to be the bramble that's going to be the king, right? And so there's there's these progressions. There's the olive, there's the fig tree, there's the vine, and then finally the bramble. And, and you can't dwell in that shade of the bramble, even though the bramble is going to be the one that wants us to trust in its shadow. The bramble doesn't even provide shadow. So, so this is what we're going to have to, you know, go into in a bit more detail to try to understand why these four, why are these four trees mentioned? Um, what does that represent? And um, and then this role of of Jotham. I mean, he's going to end up having to to go to Beer the well, and he has to dwell there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Right, and then we're going to have the downfall of Abimelech. So, I mean. How, how are we going to place this? Do we have any ideas of how we place this parable? I think that's opening a subject we haven't we haven't really addressed yet. No, we didn't address it before, really. You know, we didn't because we weren't putting it on a line. Uh, but the question is, can we put this on a line? Um, Because. Because maybe what we can say with this is, even though this um, this story we're having after July 18th, I think this parable, parallel, the parable, it goes back to earlier. I would say that we're likely going to have to place this on a line, and I wouldn't disagree with the point you were just making. Yeah. So so we finally get to the bramble at the end, but. The trees were wanting first the olive to reign over them, then the fig tree, and and then the was all of the fig and the vine, and then finally just the bramble, right? So if if we're going to take this story, can we bring this back to some other point where we're going to have the olive? We want to make the olive king. We want to make the fig king. We want to make the, the vine king. But then we finally only can convince the bramble. Or the bramble is the only one that can convince us, I guess. Because <clears throat> uh, in this case, um, when we look at this, this parable, um, so I'm just going to read this here. We'll come back to this tomorrow. Um, and it says, And when they told it to Jotham, he went up and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. So he's the 70th week. This is after we, we've we've had this, this 70-week prophecy. He's going to go back and give this illustration of what's happened in this movement. The trees went forth on a time to anoint the, a king over them. They said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness? And my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees. And then he said, then said the trees unto the vine, come thou reign over us. And the, um, and the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, if, if in truth ye anoint me king over you. Then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come down out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So here we have the symbol of this, you know, scrub brush sort of thing. Um, 
it's accepting this, having a king over them. So we would have to understand, try to understand what this means, how, how we could relate this parable uh, to either events that have happened in this movement or people who have, or, or, or different, I don't know how to explain it, but different events or, or situations um, that, that could be illustrated by this. I, I, I don't know how to really word it. I mean, because we have the trees, we have to understand what the trees are and what these different trees represent that they're wanting to have reign over them. But we, we can definitely see the bramble at the end, what that is. Aren't trees people? Yes, trees are people. But symbols can have more than one application. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but I would say it, it probably does relate to people in this movement. Isn't it saying that we're putting too much in people than in God? We should be listening to God, not the people. Mm -hmm. Yep. This movement has wanted um, it's not so much that they've wanted people to reign over them, but they've wanted other people to make their decisions for them, to decide what is truth for them instead of just studying for themselves. Doesn't mean you don't need other people to study with. So I'm not saying that, you know, you just study the Bible on your own. That's all you need to do. But there is, there is a purpose for teachers. But just because you have teachers doesn't mean you, you don't have a role that students play in understanding. Because if all a teacher does is teach, but the students don't study, uh, they're not going to learn anything. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly how we would apply this. I just have a general idea of, of how we apply this parable. There's a lot of symbolism in the different um, applications whether we start with the olive, the fig, and the vine, and then go to the brambles. So we're, this is something I think we're going to have to take a, a very um, specific look at in the morning because we're going to have to get into what these are could be symbolically representing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so so we're, we're going to have this parable to look at, and then we're going to, you know, that's probably what we can deal with tomorrow. I mean, because then we're going to deal with the downfall of Abimelech, right? But this, the, the role of Jotham in uh, giving this parable, I mean, this this is a specific message that is meant to help this movement. But, but the death of Abim, the downfall of Abimelech is going to happen in a very specific way that we again would have to address. Um, Um, so there's, I can't remember, this, this, this is a long section dealing with uh, the death of the, the downfall of Abimelech or his death. Just we got 
Okay, um, so what can we deal with in just four minutes? Okay, so let's look at one little point. Um, why are there three score and 10 pieces of silver that are going to be used to slay the 70 sons? What would the, what, how does this 70 um, relate to the destruction of the 70 as a symbol? I, I'm not understanding your question because what you just said is how do we relate the 70 in relation to the destruction of the 70 as a symbol? Yeah, so we have the 70 pieces of silver. So those are a symbol. And the 70 sons are a symbol. Now, we know that they have both the symbol of 70. But there's two different things. One is the sons of Gideon. The other is the money that's being paid to the men of Shechem who are going to kill the sons of Gideon. Now, we would know that there's a one-to-one -one correlation. So the assumption is... 70 people, each one's going to kill one of the sons of Gideon, right? So there's basically 70 assassins hired, and each one's going to kill one of the, the sons. This isn't going to be a battle in a battlefield. How, how this occurs, it doesn't give us any detail. But, but the question is, why is the 70 attached to both of these? What does that mean? Because we have the 70 as relating to the 70 weeks, right? All right. Okay. So if the men of Shechem, they have, have these 70 pieces of silver. I mean, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. But uh, to me, it's just interesting that they're going to have these 70 pieces of silver to hire these 70 men to kill the 70 brothers. Brother Theodore, yeah, I hate changing the subject, but um, on them lines you drew on Sunday, yeah, you hit over the April nineteenth, the ten. What's the ten? Is that ten nineteen? Um, I know it's changing the subject, but I apologize. I just wanted to ask that question. April nineteenth. That's yeah. just nineteen. I don't know about 10. You had it right up under April 19th. Oh, well, the first day of the first month? Or is that the, what it is? First day of the first month? Yeah. It looked like a 10 to me. That's the reason I asked. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. We're going to have to figure this out. Um, Lord willing that we can figure this out because I, I don't have. I don't have a complete understanding of this. That's um, so it's something we need to pray about, you know, before we come together and also study. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for uh, your spirit to help us as we continue to look at these things on our own. We are thankful for the opportunity we have each morning, and we do not take it for granted. It's a great blessing to be able to study together. We pray for this movement that we can once again all come together to study, that we can search out your truths. And we ask, Lord, that you can help us and correct us. Um, we know sometimes we can't see things that are right in front of us, and we need your spirit to guide and direct. So be with each person and bring us together again according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.